And I'm really um, pleased to introduce our first panel of the day on cultivating creative partnerships and leadership. Uh, our moderator is Jocelyn Zuckerman, and she is a 2017 Alicia Patterson Foundation Fellow and a contributing editor at Modern Farmer. She will be joined by panelist John Boyd Jr., the founder and president of the National Black Farmers Association, Carl Diley, president of Food Care Sealed Air, Lynette Johnson, the executive director, Society of St. Andrew, Amy Keister, the vice president of consumer engagement at Compass Group, Jude Medeiros, the regional vice president of schools at Sodexo, and Pete Pearson, the director of food waste at World Wildlife Fund. Please join me in welcoming them all to the stage. everyone. Thanks Danielle and thank you to our very diverse group of speakers. Um, I thought that since we've got folks here from uh, almost every point along the supply chain that we'd sort of organize the first part of the conversation that way starting at the farm level and working up to the consumer. So according to Wasted um, which is the updated edition of the 2012 report um, that the NRDC put out a few weeks ago I'm sure a lot of you have read it uh, food production is the most resource intensive stage of the supply chain and yet some 20 billion pounds of produce is lost on farms each year. So John, as a farmer, um, can you tell us what your biggest challenge is in terms of food waste and then um, talk about some partnerships whether with businesses or um, consumers in the form of CSAs or food banks that are helping you deal with the yes. food waste problem? Uh, first of all, thank you everybody for coming and it's great to be here be a part of this uh, wonderful uh, conversation with all these great minds this morning. And uh, I'm a fourth generation farmer and founding president of the National Black Farmers Association, 109,000 members in, in 42 states. And uh, to address the question, I think some of the things that, and challenges that we've seen uh, to combat this issue is the actual what happens uh, with the actual farmers' uh, leftover uh, uh, produce and, and, and those various types of commodities that are left over after. We sell with Heinz for tomatoes or things of that nature. There's a lot of, uh, I'm using tomatoes as an example. There are a lot of tomatoes that are left over that could uh, be used by value added, uh, where we could partner with other civic groups and other uh, different various organizations that are already have pro programs in place. So the, the challenge is, is, is to connect our membership with those programs that that are already in, in place. And some of the uh, organizations that we partnered with in the past uh, 30 years would, would, would be like the Kellogg Foundation. Uh, we reached out to them. We have a, a national uh, memorandum of understanding with the United States Department of Agriculture, a uh, national memorandum of understanding with EPA, which allowed us to engage in, in, in some of these uh, type of uh, dialogues. But we have a 30 or 40 to 40 percent food waste in this country, where we're actually wasting food that could be used. Uh, and you have the issue with uh, my, my hats and prayers off to the, the victims of Irma with uh, those uh, islands down in the, uh, the south of uh, the Virgin Islands are in desperate need of food. So if we had partnerships and things of, of this nature in place, we could immediately address those types of issues uh, right here in our own country. So I'm going to stop right there. And, uh, okay, actually, before I go on to Lynette, I do have one other question about the, the particular population that you're dealing with, well, your membership. Um, the National Black Farmers Association. Yes. Um, this is a population that suffered from a profound lack of um, resources and opportunities. So are there particular challenges in dealing with waste that maybe some of the other well, farmers the aren't dealing yes. with? That's a great question. Some of the challenges that our members uh, have, uh, it stems from, uh, from anything from access to credit right on up to, to, to actually planting those crops. But we're faced with many, many challenges uh, as African American farmers through participation in various loan programs at the United States Department of Agriculture, uh, direct assistance programs from the United States Department of Agriculture. So it makes us very, very good farmers because we have to be very, very conservative. And we don't want to waste anything, you know, where 
we're always looking at our, our bottom line. And, and farmers, we don't think from month to month like the average consumer does, paying their mortgage and, and from month to month. We think about year to year. When I plant that crop, it's all about planting and harvesting and graduating to, to next year. So we're always planning. And uh, so in this particular instance, on this particular issue, we have to find a way, if I plant something, we're, we're, where exactly am I going to sell it? Uh, how far the market is away? And what happens to those commodities that are left over? Is there a market there for me as well to, to sell that? And I think that's where, that's where the opportunity lies on, the, on this particular issue, is how do we bridge the gap and bring what we have uh, as actually growing the food in, in a very conservative way, how do we bring those tools to other, other partnerships by working together to make sure that all this food is used? Uh, that's, that's where we are on this time. Okay. Um, Lynette, you've been working on this food waste issue since 1983, correct? Since long before most of us were thinking about it. So can you talk about how the space has changed um, and also about just the, um, the history of your organization? Sure. Society of St. Andrew began uh, actually in 1979. Um, focused on the issue of um, sort of a back to the earth sustainability um, initial issue. And then within a few years, we really got focused on food waste. So beginning in 1983, we, were work we began working with farmers to get fresh fruits and vegetables that they're not able to sell um, to agencies feeding hungry people. Um, back in the early years, that was really quite a challenge because the Feeding, and ne Feeding America Network didn't exist at that time, and food banks were just beginning to be built. So our first load of potatoes in 1983 was 16,000 pounds of potatoes coming from the eastern shore of Virginia. And the food bank in Richmond, which was the closest food bank, was only two years old and had no, um, no experience dealing with a large load of food in that quantity at all of any sort, whether it was produce or something even non-perishable in that quantity. So um, we really started working at an early stage with that. And we've, it's pretty gratifying for us at this point to see that the conversation that, that we were part of 30 some years ago is now beginning to be on the national stage. Um, and being recognized as a, an important and issue. How have the logistics changed? I mean, you're working with farmers, volunteers, and feeding agencies. That seems like a lot of uh, sort of moving parts. And it is a lot of moving parts. So we um, have about 30,000 volunteers a year that work with us, gleaning in about 22 states. We do large load recovery in 35 states and distribute in 48. And the key pieces for us would be the farms having food available that they're not going to be able to sell. Um, so food that's not commercially marketable, whether it's the wrong shape, size, color, the market price is too low, there are any number of reasons why that food might become available. Um, volunteers, because we do send volunteers into fields to harvest, uh, to glean what's left over, uh, picking, digging, or gathering that food. And then um, agencies to use the food to feed to their clients. So we work with soup kitchens, with shelters, with food pantries, with large food banks. Um, with Title I schools, basically anyone who's feeding hungry people, we get that food to them in quantities that they can use quickly and without waste. And how much techno is technology sort of at the heart of it in, in keeping all of the flows going? I, mean, is that, um, I imagine that would have changed since 1983. We're actually pretty low tech. Um, okay. we, found this to be, we found this to be more of an art than a science um, because if, if you're looking at it from a technology standpoint, you may have 3,000 pounds of carrots, but instead of having an agency that needs 3,000 pounds of carrots in two big bins, you may have 20 agencies that each need 40 pounds of carrots in bags. Um, so figuring out how to get the food to the end user as quickly as possible with as few steps as possible is what we've really excelled at through the years. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that um, in the hallway that the populations that you're dealing with often are very low income and might not even have a refrigerator. Um, are there other issues sort of in terms of a, a lack of wealth that you're dealing with your consumers at the end? And also do you do any sort of cooking classes or anything that might help them use their, what they're getting from the food bank? So um, Tom Calicchio, I think, alluded to sort of the vegetable vocabulary having decreased uh, generationally. Um, <clears throat> and so we certainly see that. So the um, the vast majority of folks who are hungry don't, don't know how to use any more vegetables than anyone else does. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that is always a challenge. 
Um, in a lot of cases, we work with refugee and immigrant populations who may have specific fruits or vegetables that are part of culturally part of their diet. And when we get that food, um, when that's made available to us, we'll try to funnel it to a population that already has the know-how to use it and is, is really looking for it. Um, and is that, sorry to interrupt, is that something you would go back to the farmers and say, you know, this Somali population is looking for this vegetable. Can you start growing it? Or you're just, you're just sort of funneling what's already being grown to we're, we're really funneling what's already been grown. Our philosophy is that there's already more than enough food. And we don't want to be asking people to grow more. But it could just be different. To, we want to be using what's there more wisely. Mm -hmm. um, and there was one more question you asked. I'm sorry, I lost it. I don't remember, but what I didn't ask and I wanted to ask was about the, the fact that it's a faith-based organization and how that might come into play. Sure, the, the whole notion of gleaning comes from the Hebrew scriptures um, in the book of Leviticus. Um, the Hebrew people were told not to harvest their fields more than once and to leave the corners of the fields unharvested. And the idea was that, that the food would be left for those who did not have access to the land. So the poor, uh, the widows, the orphans, uh, the strangers or aliens in the land, which would be immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, so that food was to be left for them. So um, that practice of gleaning is something that we've carried on. Um, and so because that, that is part of the, the faith tradition of both um, the Jewish people and Christians today, um, it's something that it's fairly easy to go into a new community and contact a congregation and say, hey, we're, we're following this practice. Do you want to join us? So it's, it's a, a great source of volunteers for us. And so when you enter a new community, you generally do go through the faith community? Yes. Uh, okay, okay um, moving along the food chain, we'll go to Coral. Um, and I thought since you're a food scientist, you're certainly the only food scientist on our panel, if you could talk about some, some of the main um, food safety concerns and how packaging <coughs> addresses those. Okay, be glad to. So we all, we, you know, have a, um, you know, deep, interest in not only food waste but also food security and we definitely believe they go hand in hand. So uh, not only do we have the ability through uh, technology to increase the shelf life of a food product, also to enhance the food safety of the food product. And I believe kind of Joan set the stage, you know, in her opening comments that it's a system. It's not just packaging, it's the whole process. We've done things like work with the WWF in China on developing the protocol for like poultry to go from a wet market where 30% of the food is wasted and a significant quantity of um, food uh, borne illness occurs due to cross contamination to, a, uh, to the protocol to have a end to end solutions which includes packaging to extend the shelf life and to enhance the food security. Um, you know, to, to drive, um, you know, minimizing food waste and enhancing the food uh, security risk. So um, I think all of that is, you know, what I think is so wonderful about what we're doing today and having a panel like this is everyone has a role to play in addressing the issue. Mm -hmm. And it is an end-to-end -end process. And some of the biggest challenges are is at where most of the food waste occurs, which is at retail and the consumer, <laughs> is where we have some of the largest uh, issues or pushbacks on adopting or accessing some of the technology. And so what's the, what are packaging technologies that are addressing that? So well, we have a whole host of uh, packaging solutions that through both uh, vacuum packaging and barrier protection extend the shelf life of meat products, for example. There's a whole host of technologies in the produce area that can extend the technology or extend the shelf life three to 90 days, giving the, the retailer more time to merchandise the product as well as the consumer more time to consume it. And I think it was mentioned in one of the previous panels about freezing. You know, was, you know the view is freezing is bad, but if you have a package that not only extends the shelf life, but is freezer friendly for the consumer, and you can educate the consumer, if they don't consume the product by its uh, a best if used by date, they can then freeze it and uh, preserve it for uh, a, uh, you know, even years. So um, I think all of it is the, just understanding the technologies and then understanding the interplay of it's not just the packaging, it's the right 
processing conditions, it's the right distribution and transportation, uh, temperature control throughout, and uh, that all of that, when orchestrated together, uh, can significantly, um, you know, provide not only the humanitarian thing of the three billion people going to bed without enough calories, as well as the uh, environmental issue that food waste generates. I mean, just the um, emissions that food waste generates, it would be the third largest country if it were an entity in itself on, on that. And then there's obviously the uh, economic value because if retailers are, are selling the product versus throwing it away or consumers are getting the value out of the product, there's a huge amount of economic loss with, uh, with food waste as well. Um, so you mentioned the program in China with w WWF, and I know you work both in the developing and developed world. Um, I'm curious about in the developing world where we're not talking about freezers, how, right. how packaging comes into play there and sort of what the main challenges are. Yeah. Some of the main challenges in the developing markets is that the consumer has a wet market mentality and fresh is unpackaged or fresh is um, basically, you know, hot, you know, they call it warm pork or whatever versus product produced, you know, kind of in a modern system. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, I think all of that is, you know, uh, some of the intricacies of working in a developing market is you have multiple things that you need to address. So in this poultry initiative, which we did with the World Wildlife Fund, as well as the um, the uh, retail associations is we had to work every step. We had to start at the processor. What are the right protocol? What are the critical control points? How do you distribute it? What are the temperature controls you need to have? As well as in how do you, um, you know, merchandise and market it in, in a retail where it actually, you know, a few feet away is basically raw product in a bin, unpackaged where the consumers are physically picking it up and putting it in a bag. So it's a real, you know, dichotomy, but it's one step at a time. And but where, how does that packaging come into play if, if a consumer is then taking that chicken home to some place where they don't have a refrigerator uh, and they, uh, they have to cook it right away anyway? You see a lot of daily shopping and right. you, even a, a real significant. I mean, sometimes you uh, in developing countries you leapfrog technologies. There's a very significant amount of home delivery, but it's 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 more more like what are you going to consume today? So portioning becomes a, a very much a part of the solution. Home delivery, that's interesting. Yep, in, like in cities in Yes. Mm -hmm. in I China think the or? previous speaker talked about Shanghai having 25 million. It's probably you know, more like 30 million. And so you have huge concentrations of people. And they do, you know, from a lot of the modern retailers, whether it's Carrefour, uh, Walmart, whatever, they, they're, in, they're developing you know, e-commerce home delivery. I mean, you have a real you know, a bifurcated population. You have, you know, the, um, the young that are absolutely modernized and ordering, you know, e-commerce and getting, you know, either in-store pickup on their way home or delivery. And that changes the whole dynamics of how the product needs to be delivered to minimize, you know, cross-contamination. You have to have a leak-proof package. You have to have a portion package for, uh, uh, that is consumer-friendly as well. So, uh, and what are you working at all on initiatives, say in like rural Africa, where the the problem is food, with food waste is a lack of infrastructure, and so things rot in the market because there isn't yeah. a road to get it to yeah. somebody. Yeah. So probably people on the panel better uh, uh, able to answer that question, but we look at it as in those type of areas, it's food loss, and it's typically at the farm level or the way to the processor, whereas in most more uh, developed uh, economies the food waste uh, is, occurs uh, at the end of the cycle, not at the beginning of, of the cycle. But, uh, you know, there, you know, what we would do is we highly support, you know, education and, uh, again, back to, the, you know, the basics of uh, how food should be harvested and or processed and distributed. So that would be more like a help working with NGOs rather than absolutely. a particular packaging right. Abs technology. Absolutely. Okay. You know you know, providing that thought leadership in that position where, you know, we work with people to make sure that the, you know, best, ha best uh, handling processes are, are understood and, and educated. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And then, then that then in the future packaging comes. Okay, thanks. Questions? Oh, thank you.
want some food. Yeah, the average age of uh, farmers and farmers in the National Black Farmers Association. The average age of a farmer is 60. <clears throat> so I think in the coming years, if we don't reach out and get more young farmers into farming and agribusiness, I think that uh, the abundance of food, you will see an effect of that in the coming years. And that's for, that's for all farmers, not just for African-American farmers, but the age of farmers are, are getting older and we don't see the, the amount of interest from young people wanting to take over those family, take over those family farms. And another thing that I wanted to plug in, as I hear the conversation moving, when farmers plant crops, uh, uh, we plant to the tune of that market, where we have the actual market for tomatoes, onions, potatoes. Um, we don't plan for the after effect uh, of what's left over. So if those things aren't put in place at the beginning of the, of the cycle, like you just talked about, uh, so we need more emphasis on the beginning of the cycle of working with farmers to to what to do with the, to the, the actual commodity that's actually left over. So those are two things that I wanted, I just wanted to add in there. And again, that would be establishing partnerships. And establishing it was something I sort of Absolutely. asked before. Do you think that, that there's a difficulty among your membership in establishing, I mean, is there, is there racism it, yeah, involved in making partnership It's very hard, harder, it's very difficult. To find uh, and I want to stress that today, the actual, uh, number one, the actual relationships uh, to Get contracts with uh, uh, black and other minority farmers is a very difficult process. Uh, the actual uh, process to uh, uh, obtain equipment and, and, and op farm operating loans. And many people don't understand that's watching this show. Farmers need farm operating money every year. It's not like a business loan when you go out and borrow a business loan and that loan carries you five or six years depending on how you manage your business. We need a farm operating loan every year to plan on time and harvest on time. If the loan is giving at a, a, a slow effect, then it's going to affect on our yields. And uh, if we don't get a farm operating loan, we ne may not be in business next year. So the actual difficulties of, uh, especially in this case, of uh, black farmers obtaining credit has been very, very difficult at the United States Department of Agriculture. And uh, me and Secretary, former Secretary Bill Sachs spent many years working on that. Uh, to try to get uh, programs and, and things of this nature on the farm bill to curtail that type of thing. So it's been a very, very difficult uh, process for African American farmers. And we'll see what happens now, right? <laughs> yes, we're still probably going back the other way. I don't direction. know if it's going to get any better with this current president, but I don't know if we're going there. This is not a topic for this panel today. So. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, Pete. Um, can you talk about, so your organization bridges the gap between producers and consumers. Can you first explain to us the um, the relationship between food waste and wildlife conservation, because there's, there's a couple steps in there, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's something I have to usually uh, explain a lot because people don't instantly make that connection. So yeah. you think the panda and the cute animals and the things that we love out in the wild, uh, what's the connection to food waste? Well, it's, it's the primary driver of biodiversity loss, food production. Food production is the reason why we go into forests. It's the reason why we... Uh, till grasslands and it's not just places that are somewhere else right it's not just south america uh, even in the united states and in, in the great plains the northern great plains you know, we're losing native grasslands on a pace that's even greater than brazilian rainforest loss you know most people don't register that as 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 a thing um, so when you look at food production it's critical that you also are understanding not only try not to convert all this native habitat globally. But when you look at how much food we waste, then there's an automatic connection, right? Why are we still going out and converting all these amazing places to agriculture when we probably grow enough food to make do? We have enough of a footprint now with agriculture, we could probably freeze that footprint uh, and we could make do with what we currently have, but we don't. The reality is we're still expanding. We're still expanding agriculture globally and we do it at a time when we also waste a lot of food. So I just read, I, I imagine a, a number of people in the audience too, there was a piece in the New York Times a few days ago about a partnership that you um, particularly are working on with Hyatt um, on downsizing hotel buffets. I, don't, I just heard Tom Colicchio say that he would like to see them go the way of the dinosaur. I don't think that's gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, but so how are you improving things? Uh, so talking about partnerships, the partnership is actually more broadly with the American Hotel and Lodging Association and uh, the hotel and hospitality community at large. 
Um, the article that you're referring to, uh, Hyatt was, was one company that stepped up and decided to do a, a partnership on looking specifically at a hotel buffet, uh, working with IDEO and the Rockefeller Foundation at one location to see how tight you can get that buffet. How, how much food waste can you actually prevent from being generated? So this was something that was fundamentally different. It's not about how much can we donate or how much compost can we create uh, because fundamentally we don't grow food to compost it. That is not our goal, right? We do not want to grow food just so we can generate energy from it, you know, unless we get, you know, the Mr. Fusion from Back to the Future. Does anybody remember that? I mean, you cannot recycle your way out of this problem because you can't capture all that embedded energy that went into food. So the, 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 what we did at Hyatt was we started a rapid prototyping exercise where we just were trying things to try to prevent as much food waste from being generated as possible and seeing what came up. The IDEO team spent four or five days on site. Uh, they worked with the <coughs> chefs, they worked with the, the stewards, they worked with people all throughout the business and they came up with these great amazing ideas and really generated a lot of energy around preventing food waste and then also still giving people that experience that they wanted. So that's one thing you don't touch in a hotel is you're there for an experience and nobody wants to be told they can't have something, right? Uh, so how do you give that experience yet still behind the scenes the way that it's working is preventing and really, I liked how Tom said it, valuing food. That's what we need to get back to. Everybody within the business understanding food's inherent value and uh, you know, making sure that it shows in how we deliver food to people. Okay, moving on to the consumer. Amy, uh, you oversee sustainability and waste reduction strategy for a company that feeds 9.5 million people a day. <coughs> and you've committed to reduce waste by 25% by 2020. Um, and I know you have a partnership with ReefHead, so if you could talk about that and the role that data plays in that. Good morning. And thank you, Food Tank, for having this very important discussion here. And J Jocelyn, it's just a pleasure to be on the stage with you. Really applaud all your research that you've done on how we eat and the impact that it has for us globally. So thank you very much. Um, it is an honor to be here today representing Compass Group. We are the world's largest food service company. And globally, we serve 5 billion meals a year. And so we take it as our obligation as the leader in leading experts in food to really combat food waste and to not only in our kitchens, but to effectively teach people simple things that they can all do at home. We're very proud of our efforts so far where we've rescued over 3 million pounds of produce that would have just gone straight from farm to landfill. We also have worked closely with the Food Recovery Network and right here in the city with City Harvest on recovering um, wholesome food for those in need. We got a great story of last week. A good friend of ours, Chef Jose Andres, gave us a ring and said, we need help in Houston. So we took our top culinary talent here in New York City working for Restaurant Associates, flew them down to Houston with our partners um, with Wolfgang Puck at the Convention Center. They made a kitchen underneath the city overpass. They fed thousands of people who lost everything. Hot, wholesome, delicious meals. Two days. Then they got another call being told, we need some help in Beaumont. It's just around the corner. So of course our chefs say, no problem, get in the trucks. Well, it's Texas. So right around the corner is 90 miles away. <laughs> and with you know all the damage from the storm, the GPS redirecting them every um, corner that they went, it took several hours. Um, and on the way, it was very staggering of seeing the amount of water and just the parking lots that were still submerged underwater with tractor trailers um, a week after the storm. So they made it to this church, and there people had nothing. They had crock pots with just a little bit of food that they were able to scoundrel and with FEMA giving them a f big frozen truck, f big truck filled of frozen waffles. So how happy were they when they come and get this delicious barbecue and collard greens prepared fresh. So again, this isn't something that we can do alone, but we're really, really proud of the efforts that Compass has done. And so with that, since this, we can't do it alone, we've launched a holiday called Stop Food Waste Day. 
in partnership with Chef Tom Colicchio, who I think we can all admit is an incredible pioneer in this space, with Eatable, two fantastic young women who really will change the world and save the food. You're gonna hear a lot of great stuff today. I ask everyone, especially those of you streaming on Facebook, join the pledge, stop food waste day, follow us on social media. You're gonna learn a lot of tips on how to be efficient in your kitchen, how to make the produce that you love last longer, how to properly prep it, really great recipes, and we keep talking about it, but how do we understand those very, very confusing food date laws? Um, so again, this isn't something that we can do alone. I really ask that everyone join me, join Compass, regardless of your organization, and stop food waste day. Then talking about our commitment on the 25%. That's not easy when you're a for-profit for company that already is really, really efficient. Um, we have a lot of trainings, um, materials, and we heard Chef um, Colicchio talk earlier, you're never gonna meet a chef that wants to waste food. However, we are committed from our executive leadership. You'll never have a meeting with our COO, Rick Post, where he doesn't say, we need to reduce food waste, we need to be leaders in this space. So what we've done is we've made simple tools. Again, it has to be easy for our chefs. And so we have a robust menu management tool that we're constantly enhancing. We launched Waste Not, which is a very, very simple tool. There's lots of tools out in the market. It's simple on just bringing awareness on how to measure waste in the kitchen, gives you the alert of knowing, okay, I'm overproducing here, what can I do? We have little videos, really great messaging from chef to chef on how to improve that and then fantastic partnerships with the likes of Refed. They came to our accounts because we're working together on a toolkit on how not only our chefs, but all chefs can reduce food waste. And they were blown away by our daily process and our commitment to reducing waste. It's, is it perfect? No. Will it be? We hope. And every day we're committed to reducing waste little by little. And we think from that drive all the way from our dishwashers to our talented culinarians and our fearless leaders that we will reduce food waste by 25% by 2020. Thanks, Amy. Jude, sticking, yeah. sticking with consumers, small ones in this case, um, can you talk about changes that Sodexo is making in school cafeterias and kitchens? Oh, yeah, sure. I, I mean, I have the pleasure of, of working in schools with Sodexo, and, and we have so many different tools out there. And recently, we've collaborated with Lean Path on a real simple tool. Um, Sodexo is very data-driven, right? So we, we really like to, to, to follow our progress so we can manage our business along the way to reduce waste, to reduce costs, and uh, more importantly, to be, to be more efficient. And what we found was that we actually have a higher employee engagement um, because they, they love this work, they love the training that they received and, and uh, you know, to be able to, to explain what's going on in the world to our hourly associates and have them really pick up the mantle and drive this program has been really exciting. But in schools, and when you talk about partnerships, in schools, every single one of our school district is, is a partner. And they're all in various stages of, of uh, sustainability. I operate in two states mainly, California and Arizona. Uh, they couldn't be more different. Um, I have conversations in Arizona about how about we recycle, you know, and in California, I better have my act together and we better be pulling out all the stops and running all the, the programs that we can. So what we've done um, specifically in California is we have a program that it, it's a project more or less, it's called Because. And it's really about teaching children what's going on in the world and helping them make behavioral changes so they can be good corporate citizens as, as they move through their lives. So we've had great success, success with that. We do easy things like um, trash sorting day, you know, and of course the kids originally balked at that. Um, and then, you know, once we, once we were done with food sorting day, the next day they're like, hey, where are all the garbage bins? So kids are great, they're sponges, um, and we're, we're so lucky to be able to meet these different districts on their journey and, and support them with our tools and resources. And just getting path, uh, back to our collaboration with Lean Path, you know, it, it, we have uh, something called Waste Watch, and it's, it's so easy, it's similar um, to what Compass is doing. I mean, we are, we are weighing our trash. We are um, saving up our trash in, in a clear plastic container so everybody can see uh, what's going on in the garbage. And then we trace, uh, we tra 
We track that waste is what we do. <laughs> um, yikes. We track that waste with the online tool from LeanPath. And again, it has really helped us made, made significant strides in, in our production. Um, hey, are we, are we buying too much? Or do we need to change up our menu? So it's really been brilliant. And then we get to show all this additional value to our clients, right? Because we can, in schools, we can, uh, we can create lesson plans around the information that's happening right in that specific school district. Um, and we also can really help them on their journey and, and be, um, be consultants, really, uh, in, in their mission uh, to, to create a more sustainable future. How does the education piece of it work? Do you like work with health teacher? I don't imagine you're showing videos in the cafeteria or like, how does that? On the ground, how do, they, how do the kids get educated about this yeah, stuff? So um, it, we have um, several different lesson plans that we, sh that we share with our school districts. And many times, we, we try to, to bridge the gap. So if, if we're teaching about mushrooms one day in the classroom, the goal is for them to then transition into the cafeteria where we have mushrooms for them to try. So it's an extension of the classroom. We also just uh, signed a, a global agreement with school. And they have a lot of really wonderful resources as it relates to for classroom learning. School, forgive me. S K O O L. I don't know what that is. Google it. Why don't you tell <laughs> us? <laughs> Can you tell us? Maybe everybody else knows. Um, uh, well, I, this is new for Sodexo, so all my sustainability colleagues are cringing now because let's <laughs> let's remember I'm an operator, right? I'm on the ground, so I'm I'm not at the planning. I'm at the executing. Uh, but it's an organization in Europe, I believe, that, that focuses on nutritional and um, sustainable education okay. for students. And it, it, they provide classroom learning for teachers. Okay. One thing that we've done at Compass, too, is launching um, a teaching kitchen collaborative working with the Harvard Business School and the CIA. But with it, it's actually coming to the classrooms and having live kitchen de demonstrations. And in it, it's how to use um, vegetables back to the point of the diversity of different produce that we should be serving, introducing new produce, and also how to cook with leftovers. So we're doing that all the way from our K through 12 up to our colleges and actually throughout our whole entire organization with great success. Okay, um, I have more questions, but I think maybe I'm supposed to open it up to the audience. Is that correct? Danielle? Microphone woman, not here. Okay, well, we can continue talking. In the, unless, does somebody have a question? Yes? I don't know where the microphone is. You might have to shout. Sorry. This is a question for, for Carl. What would you say would be the uh, single biggest impact that packaging could and does have on, on the reduction of food waste? Well, uh, for those of you that might not have heard the question, is what's the single biggest impact uh, that packaging can have on, on food waste? And I have a friend that is in the, um, is in the food processing, and he has a, 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 a mindset or a, a philosophy that the worst thing he can do is harvest an animal. We call it harvesting now instead of slaughtering but more politically correct, but it's harvest an animal and have any part of that animal wasted. So the average um, food travels over 1,500 miles in North America. So we've got to get that food from where it's produced to where it's consumed in a safe, wholesome manner. And to me, you know, I think uh, Refed did a, um, you know, a road mapping instead of the 27 intervention steps that can positively impact getting the food to the consumer, you know, the uh, packaging is in the top three. So obviously it sounds self-serving because I live and breathe packaging every day, but I believe that the biggest positive impact it can have is to make sure we're preserving that product to get it to the consumer in a, in, in a manner that, that delivers uh, food safety and delivers uh, the highest level of nutritional quality and with an extended shelf life. And so when, when you look at that, it's not just about the animal. I, th I think a few speakers have already mentioned that a pound of ground beef it uses 100 gallons of water to produce that pound of ground beef, it uses two pounds of grain and it produces 50 pounds of CO2 emission gas. The absolute last thing we want is at the end of that 1,500 mile journey is that product to go to landfill. It's gotta be preserved and of the quality that the retailer can sell it and the consumer can consume it 
and uh, get the most value extracted out of that, that um, whole end-to-end -end process. Yes? Interesting point. Um, in California, a, a, over 90% of school districts are doing their own food service program, right? So we're just a little cog in the wheel in California. But something that we developed a couple of years ago is a program called Think California. And it basically f focuses on three major things, clean, fresh, and local, right? So we're, we're trying to reintroduce more scratch cooking into the menu because it's become such a frozen and heat up situation that, that it's actually scary. We're also very focused on cleaner labels, um, introducing products that have seven ingredients or less, and, and really um, talking to parents and caregivers about that. So for the student, it's a hot dog. For the parents, it's a nitrate-free hot dog, right? So we're just trying to make these little changes in the menu. And then lastly, buying local, um, especially um, a, a vast majority of my business is, is in that Central Valley market with all of that agriculture. Um, so it really helps us to, to re-establish menus and, and purchase things more locally. Like, so for example, rotisserie chicken and foster farms, right? It's a, it's a marriage made in heaven. So I think, you know, I think school districts have done things the way they've always done them. And it's, it's very difficult for uh, school districts to change because it's what they know. And the truth is, is they're not really, they're experts in education, they're not necessarily experts um, in nutrition. Um, so, you know, we try to influence as, as best as we can, but even in California, we have a very, very long way to still go. Um, especially as it relates to some of the, um, the nuances um, with the California Department of Education. So, you know, sharing tables, not really look, you know, they're frowned upon in California, which, doesn't make sense to me, right? Because there's always a child who, who could you know, use that extra apple or go to the nurse and they're feeling a little dizzy. Is there a banana in there from them left over from the cafeteria? So it's, um, it's, it's, an, interesting, um, it's an interesting predicament that we're actually in. And I think it's, it's companies like ours that are really gonna help educate the people. Um, and, and hopefully we will get more partnerships um, because of our experience and our knowledge uh, in the industry. Can I add what? one thing? Please do. Just real simple. Have them do a food waste audit. Have the school take a day, do a food waste audit, figure out how much they throw away, tie that into a lesson plan on food's ultimate value, what the cost is to food, and make this something that happens every day in the schools, right? Have the cafeteria become a classroom. And when you start doing that, you start to change the dynamic. And if our seven, I have a seven and 11 year old, right? seven-year-old son, 11-year-old daughter, if they're not doing the composting and the recycling, which they complain about every week, we are losing a huge opportunity to build momentum. We're just prolonging the problem if our kids do not take on this new way of thinking about food. Took the words out of my mouth, Pete. We have several audits going on in California and Oregon at our schools. And the other thing that's super simple is it's how you prepare it. it a lot of kids aren't gonna just eat the whole apple, cut it up. Like it's just little things that we forget about, but it's just the presentation of the food. And what about getting rid of trays? How much is that a thing? Is that something that many of your schools are doing, Jude? We have. Um, you know, we're, 
I, I think we see that more in our campus services segment, uh, more than schools. Um, we have switched over and and years ago to to red baskets, which are reusable and washable. So we're how big are they? Not that big, but they hold the USDA portion guidelines. Everything fits. Um, so, so we've tried to we've tried to eliminate uh, trays in, in, in that way. Uh, but it, it is difficult, especially with the babies, right. the little ones. Okay, I have another question for you. So yes, hold on to the mic from somebody named Chinka Harper. She's a student in Washington D.C. Um, she says college students waste an average of 640 pounds a year. What are you doing to reduce, reduce food waste in college? Oh gosh. Okay. Well, I, again, I work in the in K twelve, but in our campus services division uh, segment, excuse me, we actually have uh, sustainability managers on each and every campus. So the commitment there, we're making the commitment from an HR standpoint. We have the people in place to do the work. Um, we continue to do things like, you know, trayless, uh, wasteless week, which is a, a week long. Um, learning opportunity where we, we do different things in our in our surveys to teach um, college students um, about sustainability and waste uh, we also uh, partner up with green teams and you know whatever is going on in campus we're right there um, if if not for just an extra pair of hands but for uh, you know additional guidance so there is a lot of good great work being done in, in campus services and the kids demand it right so it's not like we can sit back and not do it. it it's it's a it's um it it's what we do for for business reasons and and uh, so that's something you're seeing year after year more more increase of demand from students. Absolutely, they want things to change. Absolutely, mm -hmm. tell but them I imagine that pledge. tell them take the pledge, stop food waste day, <laughs> and no, all the colleges are and they're saying what is it today? I won't waste whatever it is. Today I'm going to make sure that I raid my fridge and try a new recipe. Go online, get everyone, yeah. tell us what you're doing at your university to stop food waste day. But, That's the only way we'll change. But I, I think even the way you, the phrase, phraseology of the question is part of the problem. You, uh -huh. she, the question was what are you doing about food waste, not what can they do about food waste. We've surveyed consumers uh, around the world and eight out of 11 countries food waste is in the top three consumer concerns. Mm -hmm. But when asked, is it a problem in your household, it's on the bottom, or what is the problems you're addressing in your household, food waste is at the bottom of the list. Mm -hmm. So everything the panel talked about on education is vital. Starting young, obviously, is really vital. But if the consumer doesn't think, whether they're eating at a restaurant or they're eating at their home, if they don't think that they are part of the solution, Anything we do today is going to be, may help, but it's not going to drive to the ultimate solution. The consumer has got to be engaged and take ownership in driving for uh, food waste solutions. So I applaud all of what, what you're doing because it is. And they can be trained. We've had retailers tell us their consumer can't be trained. With the right information and the right message, they, they, they can make an impactful difference. Thank you. Another question here? I think that consumer perception is really important. And um, Vanessa Wong mentioned about the perception of garbage, that we are looking at this as garbage. And I think you would probably have the most impassioned response to what can you, each of you do to inform our consumers that we're not talking about garbage. Yeah, I think the key is we got to change the terminology. It's not food waste, it's wasted food. And it's still delicious and it's wholesome and it has so much nutrients. So we really do need to change that perception. And with garbage, stop thinking of it out of sight, out of mind. I think it's great when doing these audits with young kids, if you have the clear ba baskets and they're l throwing all this trash away, which is perfectly edible food, it will change behavior. One thing I want to add too is you have to separate it from the garbage. It has to be two distinct streams you know one day hopefully it's blue for recycling and green for food for food and I can't tell you how difficult that is like you go into any institution any food service and just say put food in a green bucket that's four or five months like to get the whole <laughs> operation and everybody like what I, we got to do what mm -hmm. so that's just those simple things can be very tough but they are the one thing that we have to do you know we have to just commit to that and if I can add to that, um, it is sometimes difficult to get farmers to separate the concept of crop loss from food loss. 
So if they are, um, when they, they cost their, their, what they've grown, if they only cost it across what they sell, then they're not looking at that as food, they're looking at it as waste, um, what they can't sell. Um, so when we first started working with farmers, um, particularly with potatoes, the, the question was, what do you do with the potatoes you can't sell? And the answer was, well, we sell all the potatoes we grow. No, 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 what about the ones that are too big, too small, too this, too that? And then suddenly a light bulb would go off and the answer would be, oh, you mean the ones we throw in the woods? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so another question right up front? Here. Okay. Um, my question is for Carl. My name is Anna Herforth, representing the Agriculture to Nutrition Community of Practice. I wondered what your take is, and also others involved with any kind of packaging, um, the trade-off between packaging to preserve food, and then what happens to the packaging itself and the waste yep. for that. So that's a great question because, you know, there's no doubt if you poll a lot of people, they'll think packaging is part of the problem, not part of the solution. And, um, but when you look at the investment of either BTUs or any way you look at it, the return on investment of packaging is at least 14 to one as far as preserving the product. When you look at emission gases, when you look at it on any, you know, um, any platform, it, it's obviously part of the solution. We're talking about very thin materials that are absolutely uh, part, part of the solution. And I've been told we're done. Uh, that you need to wrap up. So I'd be glad to talk to you more later because there's many compelling argumentations. And again, it's education. Can I get in one statement? Uh, you have to ask Danny, she's yeah. the boss. Very short. Yeah. Very short. Uh, go out and support a farmer. Support your local farmer's markets. Uh, it's the hardest occupation in the world, people. Thanks, everyone.